We need to talk about something that just came up last month. The Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who is the leader of Saudi Arabia, therefore he speaks with clout, uh, what he says people listen to, was on an interview, uh, the Liwan al Mudaithar show, that was done by Abdullah al Mudaifar and he is the one he's well known for doing interviews. This it was then broadcast on Al Arabiya News, which is the broadcast channel for the Saudi Arabian government. And you can go up on Al Arabiya and just look at this, look at the interview. It's about an hour and a half long. And it was the last third of this interview, the last third segment, where he was questioned about the scripture, about religious punishments. He was questioned concerning the Quran. He was questioned concerning the Hadith and extremism. And <laughs> said some amazing things. Now, my good colleague, Hatun Tosh, has already put up a video already earlier. You can go up on DCCI. Go and look at it. It's about five minutes long. <clears throat> where she has a friend of hers unpack it real quickly in about five minutes. What I would like to do is actually go and give you segments of what he actually said from Al Arabiya Television. Uh, it's uh, it's been re recorded in Arabic, all, uh, but it's been translated with subtitles in English at the bottom, so you can follow the subtitles. And I'd like you w to watch and look at the subtitles, and then I would like to unpack each one segment by segment to show you the dilemma that's happening right now. Look what's happening to Islam. Look what's happening to Saudi Arabia. Look what's happening to this whole difficulty concerning what are they going to do with extremists? What are they going to do with moving Islam into the public sphere and bring it into the 21st century and bringing it into modern ways of thinking and modern ways of practice. There's a real dilemma here. You can understand this and this is why I want to bring this to the fore because it's so recent and he said some things that, that are causing quite a stir on the internet and quite a stir around Muslim, uh, uh, certainly Muslim countries and within theological departments within those countries. So here's the first clip where we're just going to look at what he said quickly about the Quran itself. So, the Amir has spoken in a previous time about the meaning of أكثر من ألف سنة هم يجتهدون بما هو مفهوم الاعتدال فما أعتقد أنه أنا في موقع أقدر أشرح وش مفهوم الاعتدال بقدر ما أنه ألتزم بدستور المملكة العربية السعودية اللي هو القرآن والسنة ونظامها الأساسي للحكم وتطبيقه على أكمل وجه بمفهوم واسع يشمل الجميع اللي منصوص عليه بالقرآن بشكل واضح يعني لا يجب أن يطرح عقوبة شرعية بدون نص قرآني واضح أو نص صريح من السنة. So what he's doing here, he is claiming pretty much that it must be the Quran only. We're going to come back to that because he talks more about that later on. But he's saying that in order to understand how we're to live today, it must be the Quran alone and only the Quran, along with Hadith. But he's only saying certain Hadith. What hadith? And this is what has been causing such a stir. It's what he said about the hadith that made most uh, people uh, sit up and listen. Let's see what he said about the hadith. طبعا لما اتكلم عن نص صريح من السنة اغلب المدونين الحديث في تدويناتهم يصنفون حديث بناء على تصنيفهم الخاص مثل البخاري والمسلم وغيره. إنه حديث صحيح أو حسن أو ضعيف لكن في تصنيف آخر هو الأهم أوه. اللي هو الحديث المتواتر والأحاد والخبر آه وهو المرجع الرئيسي في استنتاج الحكام واستنباطها آه من الناحية الشرعية فلما أتكلم مثلا عن الحديث المتواتر اللي هو يعني من جماعة لجماعة 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 مجموعة أشخاص يعني عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فهذه الحديث قليلة للغاية لكن ثباتها قوي 
جدا وتفسيرها يخضع لاجتهاد حسب الظرف والمكان وحسب كيف فهم هذا الحديث بينما الأحاد اللي هو فرد عن فرد عن فرد عن فرد عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أو جماعة جماعة عن فرد عن جماعة عن جماعة عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ففي فرد في الحلقة فهذا يسمى حديث آحاد وهذا يصنف أصناف كثيرة منه الصحيح ومنه الحسن ومنه الضعيف وهذا حديث الآحاد غير ملزم بإلزامية الحديث المتواتر إلا إذا اقترن بنصوص شرعية واضحة وبمصلحة دنيوية واضحة خاصة إذا كان حديث أحد صحيح وهذا يشكل أيضا جزء قليل من حديث رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بينما الخبر اللي هو عن فرد 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 ما نعرف عن فرد 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 رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أو عن جماعة جماعة فرد فرد ما نعرف عن جماعة فرد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ففي انقطاع هذا الخبر هو يشكل النسبة العظمى من الحديث هذا بشكل لا يؤخذ فيه So it's fascinating what he did and what he said about the hadith. You can see he's he has a dilemma here. This is a real dilemma for him. The problem is the hadith. The problem are the traditions. The problem is what Muhammad actually did and uh, did and said. And that's why you can see he's backing off from the hadith. He has to. And so he's saying pretty much that we only accept those hadith that agree with the Quran. So the Quran becomes the standard. Understandable. This is nothing new. That's nothing that, and not everybody doesn't say. But what he's going on and saying, however, there are different gradations, and he's referring to the three gradations of hadith. We know them as sahih, which is strong. And we know them as hasan, which would be medium, and the wiyul taif, which would be the weak. So he's giving those gradations. He just says in English. Well, the English translation doesn't uh, doesn't say it. Just says a. Uh, strong, middle, or and weak. But the words, if you look and you ask anybody who is a Hadith scholar, what he is suggesting, therefore, is that the only that which is even amongst the Sahih, which has a strong mutawatir. Now, what is mutawatir? That is a long a chain of names. And he's talked about that. And he re, he kind of downplayed and he tried to say there's a real problem with the ahadith. These are the ones that don't have a long chain. And he talked about a single chain versus many. And basically it comes down to which are the ones, which are the sayings that are the most popular. Which are the ones that have come down the longest. Uh, the, which ones have the most people. Um, we've heard that before, haven't we? With the... the the whole thing with the kira'at. Remember with the kira'at, this came out to be the same way you choose which are the strongest kira'at, which are the strongest readings, and which are the ones that are used in the riwayats, which are the transmitters. Uh, the, the, those who have the most chain of names are the ones that are chosen. It has nothing to do with content. It has nothing to do with practicality. It has nothing to do with contextualization. It has everything to do with Who's the most popular? <laughs> Seems like that's what, how Islam always finds its authority. Who is the most popular? Who's got the most say? Who's got the most followers? What's that's fascinating? Because Kamil Abdurrahmani, who has written about this and has written a number of articles just about this interview, states if you're going to throw away those that are not Sahih and those that do not have a strong Mutawatiya, then you're going to have to throw away about 90%, which seems to suggest exactly what MBS. MBS is the is the the letters that are used to describe Muhammad bin Salman, MBS. And it seems like that's what he's wanting to do here. He wants to throw out 90% of the Hadith and just go back to the Quran. Just go back to the Quran. We're going to talk about that Quran only because he then talked about this in this next segment. فالحكومة في الجوانب الشرعية ملزمة بتطبيق النصوص اللي في القرآن وملزمة بتطبيق النصوص في الحديث المتواتر وتنظر الحديث الأحاد حسب صحته وضعفه ووضعه ولا تنظر في الحديث الخبر بتاتا إلا إذا كان تسند عليه رأي في مصلحة واضحة للإنسان فلا عقوبة على شأن ديني إلا بنص قرآني واضح وتطبق هذه العقوبة بناء على كيفية طبقها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم 
So here he comes about, and what he's saying here, very clear, that the punishments, the religious punishments, must be found in the Quran only, just in the Quran, just in this book here. You have to go to this book to find any punishments. And then he kind of gave a little bit of a leeway to say, well, also the those traditions, those hadith that agree with this. And he gave the example of adultery. I didn't show that, but he went and gave the example of adultery, which in some ways is rather surprising because you have, that is one of the verses that has actually been causing a real problem for Muslim exegetes because we're not sure if it's even there. It's the verse on the Rajam in chapter 24 verse 2. Chapter 24 verse 2 talks about adultery that if you look in the Quran today and if you look what it says today it's a hundred lashes. But the, according to the traditions there are many traditions that say that the, it used to be the punishment for adultery is stoning to death. And Umar comments about this and he remonstrates against it because um, Umar says we used to stone, the prophet used to stone. What are people going to do when they look at the Quran and they found the stoning is not there? They're going to think that the Quran has been changed, which is a real problem. And that's the verse on Rajam. It's a famous verse, and it's one of those that has caused scholars headaches for centuries. So you can see why when you have MBS, Muhammad bin Salman, bring this up as an example. Either he's not aware of that, or he's not aware that this is a problem for the scholars, and he's just opened up a whole can of worms for them. But it's coming back to this view of one Quran only. And there's a name for that. And you can see that MBS is going to get himself in the problem. But before he does that, he then goes into the problem with Wahhabism. And this is where he really he is. This is what he really has to tackle. What is he going to do with this extremist brand, brand of Islam, of which his country has been exporting for centuries? Wahhabism has been around since the 1700s, since the 18th century. So let's look at this section on Wahhabism. He's asked this question about Wahhabism. Look and see what he says. You are the Amir of the Muslim school, for example, the Wahhab school, which will explain this Quran and this Hadith. For the age, we are not the same as the Muslim school, or in a certain world, it means that we are the people of the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger of Allah didn't put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala between us وبين الناس حجاب أنزل قرآن ورسول الله وسلم طبقه على الأرض والاجتهاد مفتوح للأبد والشيخ محمد الوهاب لو خرج من قبره ووجدنا نلتزم بنصوصه ونغلق عقولنا للاجتهاد ونؤلها أو نضخمه لأول من عارض هذا الشيء فلا يوجد مدرسة ثابتة ولا يوجد شخص ثابت القرآن الاجتهاد مستمر فيه والسنة صلى الله عليه وسلم, صلى الله عليه وسلم الاجتهاد مستمر فيها وكل فتاوى. So Wahhabism, he talks about this Wahhabism, and you can see the difficulty. This is why, I mean, this has been a thorn in the side for the Saudi Arabian government since the 1700s, when you had Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, who was the theologian brought in to the Ibn Saud family, bringing the two together so that they could have both the politics and the theology hand in hand. And be, by doing that, they were then able to take over, the Ibn Saud family was able to take over the entire peninsula, Arabian peninsula, and bring together with Wahhabism as their religious authority, the other tribes. One of the difficulties with Wahhabism, and this is the reason why I'm sure Muhammad Bin Salman has it really wants to shut it down. Is what a a, a scholar, Muhammad H. Fadel, Muhammad H. Fadel, who I've quoted before in the uh, series in the past, and he explains why this extremism that is so rampant with Wahhabism around the world, why it's so difficult for countries like Saudi Arabia to be held respectable. And the reason is this, and this is what he says. Amongst its most destructive consequences, he's talking about Wahhabism now, is its tendency to transform every disagreement, no matter how seemingly small, into a matter of faith and disbelief. This is because Wahhabists believed that a failure to give 
proper weight to religious texts as they understood them amounted to rejoining, rejecting divine sovereignty and was tantamount to unbelief. On this basis, he says, Wahhabists anathematized the vast majority of the Muslim world. They also adopted a rigorous doctrine of loyalty and disavowal, what I said, which is the Al-Wala wa al bara whose affirmative duty to display contempt towards unbelievers now defined to include much of the Muslim world, but also had the same duty towards Muslims who failed to or who tolerated unbelief. So you can then understand why Muhammad bin Salman wants to shut down this kind of extremism. Because it's it's the we and them. It sets the whole rest of the world against them. And this is the difficulty that Islam has had in the 21st century. And what we have always brought up, and that is Islam is always seen as pariah because of its practices, its beliefs. When practiced as this book tells them to, as this book informs them to, strictly to the letter of the law. And you can see this is a difficulty for people like Muhammad bin Salman because he is trying to open up Saudi Arabia for the West. The whole first two-thirds of this interview was all about the things that he's doing in education, the things he's doing with finances, the things he's doing with building projects and all the rest, trying to make Saudi Arabia the the central country in the world for education. He would like to get, he mentioned that he would like to get some of his universities into the top 10 in the world. Right now, there are three in the top 500 and they need to bring that so that they are, they, people come to them to be, to be fed intellectually. Uh, of course, he's trying to move the economy away from just hydrocarbons over and bring it into other areas. And that's why he's trying to make great, down to four to 7% unemployment. He's right now at 10 to 15 at the moment, so he's doing very well. And they have this plan to have this all done by 2030. But in order to do that, you've got this extremism over here. You've got these Wahhabis who have controlled the kingdom since the 1700s. That's uh, what we're talking 400 years. And there has been this tight relationship with the brotherhood. Uh, they're made up of Wahhabis and, of course, the, the princes that, are, that control the politics. Some say there are as many as 5,000 of these princes. So you can see the difficulty that's going on between the mosque and the state, what we call the church and state dichotomy. That In Christianity, we don't, we don't have this difficulty because Jesus pretty much says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God, separating the two. But this doesn't exist in Islam. So you can see the difficulty. What is he going to do with this these group, this very Salafist, this very radical group of Wahhabis, this very extremist group. And so what he says is this, and let me just quote, you just saw it. When we commit ourselves to follow a certain school or scholar, this means we are, means we are deifying human beings. God did not put a barrier between himself and the people. He revealed the Quran and the Prophet Ma imp implemented it, and the space for interpretation is open permanently. We should, therefore, engage in continuous interpretation of Quranic texts. All fatwas should be based on the time, place, and mindset in which they are issued. Whoa! So he was really taking on Wahhabism at its very core. And to be, fi to be fair, he thought that by eradicating and throwing out the Hadith and diminishing their um, importance to, uh, to just around 10% of the Hadith, and elevating the Quran that this will do it for him. And here are the problems, and this is the difficulty, and these are the things that he did that I'm going to bring up, because you can see there are a number of problems with this interview. There are a number of problems with where he's going. I can understand his dilemma. There is a dilemma with extremism. There is a dilemma if he really wants to be seen as a beacon for uh, learning, beacon for technology beacon for the whole world for people to want to come to Saudi Arabia if he wants this and he does I I really think he does desire this and he has all the petrocarbons to do so he's going to have a difficulty because if he is because the country itself has been wedded to the Quran and the Sunnah the Quran and the example of the Prophet Muhammad 
They have been wedded for centuries. How is he going to distance himself from the example of the prophet and just stick to the Quran? Well, he thought he solved it by just saying, pretty much, we don't, we don't, we don't go to those traditions that are either Hassan or Taif, and we he solved it by saying we don't follow just one man, we don't deify him and make him superior. No, we enculturate that which the Quran says and apply it for today. <laughs> Can you see the problem right away? Even if you do throw out the Hadith, folks. Even if you throw out everything of Sahih Muslim, Ibn Da'ud, Tirmidhi, and the others, even if you throw out all of Ibn Hisham and Al-Baqiri and the example of the Prophet and his biography, you throw them all out throughout all the 9th century and just go back to the Quran, you've got a number, a number of difficulties. First and foremost, he said very clearly, and this is the biggest problem that is underlying everything that I hear coming out of his mouth and coming out of so many Muslims' mouth, and that is this. The very fact that he even has to apply the hadith into three different categories is because there is no original hadith. There are nothing, there is nothing that we can look at that we can put our hands on that comes from the time of the Prophet. That's the dilemma. Everything about the hadith, everything about the tafsir, everything about the tahrik, everything about the sirah, the four genre of what we know as Islamic tradition is based on hearsay. Let me repeat that. It's based on hearsay, which is comes out of oral tradition. It's all oral tradition. Therefore, it's only attributed back to the time of the prophet, attributed to the what the prophet said and what the prophet did, because it's all from 9th and 10th century. So his dilemma was to say, well, yes, therefore, let's break it down into different categories. Sahih, Hassan, Taif. Thinking that will do it. And stipulating that that which is sahih that we're going to use must corroborate with the Quran because the Quran does not have this problem. The Quran is above man because it is eternal. It comes from God. Without thinking, see, this is the problem. Not only does he have a problem with the Hadith and the fact that it's all based on oral tradition, two to three hundred years of oral tradition, if he's going to just base on the Quran, he's got that problem as well because the Quran is also, you might say, based on Sahih, Hassan, and Taif. It's what we know as Mutawatir. What, and this is what we've been going through when we've been talking about the Qira'at. All the Quran that we have today, there are so many Qurans, we don't know which is the original one. Therefore, we have to go through them and we have to try to choose. We, we don't. The Muslims have to go through and try to choose which is the best one. And they've come up with this guy right here. This is the one that they've chosen, the Hafs. And we've gone on to that. I won't go into that. But you can see, even the one that they chose is not from Saudi Arabia. It's not from Arabia at all. It's not from Mecca, Medina. It's way up. It's way up in the east. It's way up in Kufa, up in Iraq. So even that, the whole problem problem with that he's coming up with you cannot therefore since you don't have the original since you don't have any of the manuscripts since you do not have the the original Quran from Uthman at all or to say nothing of the one from Muhammad himself you then have to go to all these guys here and you have to break them down and there are 30 of them with 93,000 differences and that's why even that's going to be a problem for him but he doesn't know that, and he wouldn't be aware of this because he's not aware of this discussion that's going on on the internet. This is still too new for him to have known about this. What he does say, though, and what he does think is the Quran is the one piece of instrument, is the only piece of text that is eternal. Therefore, it can be trusted in every category. He has not, I don't even know if he has read the Quran. He has probably read, memorized a good bit of it, but is he even aware that many of the passages in the Quran are just as bad as the Hadith? Has he even thought that through? Are you? Do you think that by just going back to the Quran and the example of the Prophet, that you're going to eradicate extremism, that you're going to eradicate the Wahhabis? What is he going to do with chapter 24, verse 2, the, story, the thing of adultery? Where in the world do we allow anybody to lash adulterers a hundred lashes, even today? Are you going to throw that verse out, 24, verse 2? Are you going to throw that one out? And he says, what about cutting off the hands of thieves? Chapter 5, verse 38. Are you going to throw that? That's in the Quran, folks. What are you going to do with chapter 47, verse 4? Cut off the heads of the unbeliever. Are you going to eradicate that? For, see, you can't. See, I don't even think he realizes that by going back to this Quran only, there's a name for that. It's called Quranism. Or uh, uh, Quran only. Are, are there are two different names. One is called Quranism. That's if you, look, if you look up in the internet, you will see Quranism. There's lots of people that believe in Quranism, and they're they're 
pulling back to Quran only because they are fed up with trying to defend the Hadith because the Hadith, the hadith just are not defendable. But you cannot therefore go back to the Quran and think that that's going to solve your problem. MBS, are you aware of that? That still won't solve your problem. Just because the Quran is so full of inappropriate verses that just do not do not help anybody. They certainly don't help me as a Christian. Make war on the people of the book. That's me. That's in chapter 9, verse 29. Until we pay the Jizya tax. Since when are, is, are we to, we specifically to pay a special tax that's different than anybody else? How is that going to, how is that relevant for the 21st century? <laughs> Kill the unbelievers. Besiege them. Lay in wait with them for them with every kind of ambush. That's chapter 9, verse 5. How about chapter 8, verse 39? Slay the unbelievers until there is no more fitna in the land, until they believe in Allah. So, folks, can you see? Since when can even the Quran be held up as a standard for today? So MBS is going to have a real problem here, and I don't think he's realized it yet. Not only is he going to have a difficulty of knowing which of the hadith are mutawatir, which are the ones that are say that he can uh, use, and not only is he going to have the problem because if he's going to look at the prophet's example, has he read the prophet's? Has he read the prophet's biography? Has he been to Ibn Isham? Did he see what the prophet did in his own country in there in Medina? Has he gone and see what he did to the Jews there, the Banu Kainuka, the Banu Nadir, the Banu Quraysh family? Has he even? Is he even aware of what his prophet did to those Jews who stood against him? And is he willing to do the very same thing for those who stand against him? Can you see? This is a fascinating time that we live in. And you can see why the Saudi Arabian government and Mohammed bin Salman very much wants to step into the 21st century, very much wants to come on board with us, very much wants to be respected by us and be held high in esteem. By those around the world. I can understand it. I feel for him. But the solutions he's coming with, this is not the solution, folks. This is not the solution. This is. This is the only solution you can really come back to. Because this is the only book that does not have any problem. Take a look at what Jesus said and did. Take a look at how he lived. Take a look at how he died and rose again. Then you will see that this is the only book that is relevant for the day it was written is the first century as the day that we live today in the 21st century. It is the only person that is as relevant for the day he lived 2,000 years ago and still relevant for today. If he really wants to solve these problems, folks, he better stop using this book as his model or as his paradigm. This is not the right book. He's got the wrong book. This is not the right man. Muhammad is not the right man. I've said so much about him. I don't want to continue that. He's got the wrong man. The wrong book, the wrong man. We've got the right book, the right man. Why don't you just come on? It'd be a lot more simple. And then people will start listening to you. And once people do come home to Jesus Christ and his gospel, then truly we will have peace. Then truly we will not have to worry about extremism. And then truly people like Muhammad bin Salman will be respected for what he's saying. It's a great time to be alive. I just love it when Muslims try to redress Islam and try to make it more palatable for you and me. The only way it can be palatable is if they come home to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you. This is Jay. Over and out.